Hello, I'm Brandon McDaniel, and I'll be presenting today The Singing Neanderthals by Stephen Miffin. We begin with Chapter 1, The Need for an Evolutionary History of Music. And we begin with a question. Why is it that humans even make music in the first place? We know for a fact that all cultures have some form of music, and that most people participate in that music to some degree. Pictured here is one of the most ancient of human cultures, that of Papua New Guinea, performing music, in this case on drums. Um, and while there is a diversity in musical style, there are some musical characteristics that are present across all cultures. For example, most cultures have some form of scale, and most cultures, uh, most cultures have some form of meter. Um, this universality suggests that music-making behavior has biological roots, and that those roots are worth studying. There is a problem, however. Uh, there's a long-standing taboo on biological explanations for human behavior. Uh, taboos on these biological explanations, including music and language, uh, have been present since the moment Darwin published The Origin of Species. Uh, this taboo has, at times, been due to either religious objections to the idea of man being an evolved creature, and at other times it's been due to the misapplication of Darwin's theory to excuse reprehensible attitudes such as xenophobia or ideas of racial superiority. But music and language share a significant connection, both in the neural pathways the brain uses to execute the behavior itself, in the medium of delivery, which is sound, and in the fact that each serves as a vehicle to interact with other members of the human species. In the years since, discoveries in the cognitive sciences have made the biological perspective for language hard to ignore. International societies for the study of language outright banned discussions of language origins in the late 19th and early 20th century, but today, the discoveries of linguistic universals have led to the study of language as a biological universal and a phenomenon of human behavior based in biology. And today, most linguists approach the study of language from that perspective. Musicologists, however, have been far more reluctant to make that shift. Since music and language share characteristics, it may be helpful to look at the two dominant views of language evolution. Most scholars that study the origins of language posit the existence of a proto-language that existed before full language evolved. Theories of proto-language typically fall into two camps. One camp holds that human proto-language was compositional in nature. The idea being that proto-language contained words only, with no grammar to tie the words together. Were this true, it would imply a very limited potential for complex utterances due to the inability to string together multiple concepts, such as the concept go, the concept outside, the concept get, or the concept stick, much less the message go outside and get a stick. According to this theory, full language would have uh, evolved via the evolution of grammar um, to tie words together. A second camp holds that proto-language, called holistic, consisted of full messages and not single words as such. This would mean that complex utterances had a single meaning, such as go outside and get a stick. Um, and that would be possible to say an utterance that had a full meaning such as that, but it would be uttered as a single individual holistic sound. The limitation in this case would be that these sounds could not be reconfigured to produce new meanings with the same components, but would involve a completely new holistic sound for every message that an early human wanted to convey. According to this theory, full language would have evolved when these holistic messages began breaking apart into segments that could be recombined in novel ways. Although academics have been exploring the origins of language, the origins of music have largely been ignored within the academic community. The few academics to treat the subject have tried to explain away music as an evolutionary byproduct of language, the most famous case being the Harvard linguist Steven Pinker. In his 1997 work, How the Mind Works, Pinker describes music as auditory cheesecake. That is to say, cheesecake exists now because it tickles all the right places on our taste buds by exploiting our evolutionary need for fat and sugar. Similarly, Pinker argues, music tickles all the right places in our brain by exploiting our language instinct and not because of anything inherent to the music itself. As it happens, I spoke to Dr. Pinker briefly at a book signing and asked him if he still held the same position. 
He didn't answer directly, but informed me of a few professors at Harvard that were, quote, reopening the question, unquote. This may indicate that Dr. Pinker himself may have been swayed in subsequent years by subsequent research. In the book, Mithen mentions Ian Cross and Robin Dunbar as a few researchers looking seriously into the question. However, the works of Nels Wallen has also been tremendously influential in developing a biological perspective on the origins of music, a field Wallen coined biomusicology. Stephen Mithen wrote this book as an attempt to review the literature on the question of music's origins and to use that perspective to shed light on music's purpose in human life and operation in the human mind. In the following lectures, I will attempt to condense this book briefly and present its findings. I hope these lectures will result in, as Mithen states, quote, a complete account not only of how music and language evolved, but also of how they relate to the evolution of the human mind, body, and society. Thank you very much.